Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure, like uh, Yolanda says, um, to be here. I'm very grateful to Cyber Voluntarios to give me the chance to talk to uh, Fisa Faran, uh, this wonderful woman. I'm professional in economies, and you will see that she knows and she's uh, an expert on so many subjects. And um, we're going to have an open dialogue. Uh, she will, I will make some, I will ask some questions, but uh, you are invited to ask anything, to make comments to her. She's very open to that. She wants to interact with you. So please do, and feel free to do that. Um, so I will introduce very shortly, because she's got a long resume that you can find in social media. Uh, she's right now a global advisor uh, for governments, uh, private uh, companies, many institutions around the world, and, but especially in, in Pakistan, her home country. And uh, she's also uh, a member of the uh, Secretary General in, in um, the high level, high level for the women's empowerment in economics. And uh, she, she's um, in the United Nations, so she's going to be talking about all these things that she does. Uh, but my first question is going to be a little bit more personal, like uh, she's been, she comes from a background in her studies from economy, I mean, economy management, and I, I want her to explain why, why did she choose these, uh, these disciplines and subjects and, and who was the, uh, the people or the, the, the stories, uh, yeah, in the, in the, in her life to, to be, doing those choices. Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me perfectly well? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I tend to talk a bit fast. I'm going to try to be slow so that our friends here in the translation box can interpret it for you well. Um, so I'll try to be as slow as I can. But if you guys want me to be slower, let me know. Okay. Um, so, I come from a very different world. I come from Pakistan, uh, where um, the, the world, the, the culture, the traditions, they're very different from where we, you guys are from Europe, right? So, I'll, I like to give you a little context of everything so you can understand my journey better, because it's from a very different part of the world, a very different society. Uh, when I was in, uh, uh, when I was doing college, coming back to your question, um, I did not know, there were, there were two options for girls. Either you get married immediately after completing your school, or you become a doctor, because doctors make good wives, and doctors make good mothers. So, you know, either you get married and become a mother, or you become a doctor, fine, and then you become a mother. I knew I did not want to become a wife immediately. I will become a good wife at some point, which I am now, after 15 years. But uh, I hope my husband agrees. <laughs> But I knew that I did not want to become, I did not want to choose the conventional path that every Pakistani woman usually goes through. And I wanted to do something different. I did not know what that different thing was. But I wanted to do something that creates an impact, that makes me proud of who I am every day, that makes, me, that makes my future children to be proud of their mother from Pakistan. Um, but I didn't know what it is. I did not know what it was. So I just chose economics because it was a very general subject and I knew it is just going to keep me open-minded and open-ended to choose my course of path in the future. If I chose biology or chemistry or engineering, I would be stuck to becoming an engineer or a, a doctor or a, you know. So I just went to the university and I saw which is the most open-ended subject I can choose that does not lock me in any one field because I did not know what field I'm going to choose, who am I going to become. So I chose economics. When I did my uh, graduation studies in Pakistan, the, uh, the norm of my family, the convention in my family, is to get the girl married off immediately after university, like immediately. And then if the husband wants, she can continue to study. If the husband doesn't want, then too bad, you know, become the good mother. 
So I knew even then that becoming the good mother is not, it's going to happen and it has happened now, but <laughs> it was not back then, 15 years ago. So I then decided to go for my master's and again till my master's, I did not know what I'm going to become in life. So I did my MBA in entrepreneurship because it was again something fancy, something inspiring, something open-ended, you know, because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I promised my parents that I'm going to go for my master's and I'm going to come back and get married, promise, and I'm going to have children, promise. <laughs> and uh, no, seriously, it was, they, they we had to... They were worried about you. Very worried, <laughs> very worried about me. They, they were like, you know, this one's out of our hands. She's, she's, I don't know what we're going to do with this monster. <laughs> But, and, and now they're super proud of me. So I'm just, I'm just telling you what was happening 15 years ago and what's happening now. Well, they're super is, proud of me now. the family pressure, I mean the The family pressure. pressure, imagine in our family, no girl had ever gone out of the country, out of Pakistan to do her masters and that too without a husband. <laughs> so I was the first one. And uh, when I, I finally went, went, and now I must tell you, after me, every girl in my family has gone out for her education. Oh, wow. Somebody to John Hopkins, <laughs> somebody to Harvard, somebody to Stanford. So, thank you. So, so I you opened, you opened the... Yeah, I realized that was the first main glass ceiling I broke. And I realized then that this is my purpose. I have to break glass ceilings. I have to be that rebel that women in Pakistan need, that women in my family need. Because I'm rebelling for the good. I'm rebelling for a purpose. And I'm going to repel, rebel to not just make my life good, but the life of many other women around me good. That's what I decided then. So at least I knew, okay, I'm going to do something for empowering women, for empowering the world, but still not, did not know what that is, what job it is, where do I apply? You know, what organization is empowering the world? So I did my master's and I did my MBA in entrepreneurship from Warwick Business School in UK. And there I heard stories of Walt Disney, Bill Gates, Richard Branson. And I kept thinking to myself, follow your dreams, follow your passion, do what you believe in. Because all these guys did that and within that they became billionaires, inspirational story characters, right? And I used to think about Walt Disney, I used to dream about all these people like, you know, McDonald's story, Richard Branson's story. It was an MBA on entrepreneurship. So I realized after that, that there is no organization that I have to apply to. I have to create my dream myself. Okay. Because the impact I want to create, I have to create it myself. I want to change the lives of women. I want to change the lives of the younger generation. I want to focus on problems that nobody's talking about, nobody's thinking about. Nobody was doing that. So I decided after my MBA that I want to become an entrepreneur. That's what I want to become. <laughs> That was the, there's yeah. nothing to choose for me. There's I nothing to choose for me. my resume to any I company. don't want to go to a so. multinational corporation and sell soap or toothbrush or, you know, whatever. I don't want to become an engineer or anything like that. I, I want to create an impact, but in my own way. Because I was very clear by that time that I have to break glass ceilings. I have to create new realities for myself and for the woman around me. I have to focus on those issues that nobody's talking about. I have to focus on those problems that nobody's solving. Mm -hmm. So I have to identify problems, create solutions, and make a business case out of it. Okay. That's what I decided in my masters. And then I came back, and again, everybody thought I'm mad because <laughs> You know, you've graduated from Warwick Business School, you've done an MBA, and now you're going to go and set up your companies and become a failure again. Are you mad? You know, you're not married, you're a failure in business. You're like, <laughs> what is wrong with you? Uh, but I was, again, by that time, very determined to do what I wanted to do. And uh, against all odds, against all, um, uh, you know, everybody was pulling me down because I wanted to focus on those development challenges that nobody in Pakistan was even thinking about. So I literally, I launched two companies back then. One was focusing on renewable energy. Uh -huh. One was focusing on women empowerment and access to energy for the 47% of Pakistan that is still living in the dark. I'll just fix this, I think it went down. So that's when you get into the into energy the, Into the energy sector, yeah. And, and surprisingly again, I went into the energy sector. I launched Pakistan's first renewable energy company, which was working on government IPP projects. We did Pakistan's first solar IPP. Mm -hmm. The first independent 10 megawatt solar power plant was by myself. 
We did Pakistan's first solar commercial building, first solar ATM, first solar milk chiller. Wow. And everybody said it's going to be a failure. Nobody is talking about solar. Nobody is doing solar. Why are you going into this in industry of renewable technology? And I said, because nobody is in the sector, that's why it gives me ample opportunity to create anything I want. First mover's advantage, right? Mm -hmm. And I was pulled down by everybody I knew, from family to friends, that you know, you're, you're doing something nobody's ever done. I said exactly, that was the point, to do something nobody's ever so, done, right? But probably there were some people that really were inspiring this uh, force, no? So initially, um, it was just a force to tap this untapped market. But as in how we, st like my teams would always sit with me and say, that this, no, but this has never been done. And I say, exactly, that's why we're doing it, right? So I was actually, even my, I, there were many points when even my teams would not believe in what we're doing. But once we started working on these projects, from big solar government projects, 10 megawatt to 50 megawatt, to solar commercial projects, uh, ATMs, milk chillers, commercial projects, to solar village projects, Pakistan has 47% of grid population. 47% of 220 million people still live in the dark. And we went out there to those areas and nobody was talking about it. So this was again an area for me to work on. So we went and we just explored what the solution can be. So for the first solution was to give them solar energy because sun was shining bright. And the second was to create energy entrepreneurship through women because I wanted to empower the women. So we made a model ourselves. It was just like writing a fairy tale. You know, so you just sit down in your, in your room, make a business model. These are the problems, okay, problem number one, no energy, give them solar solution. Uh, problem number two, the women are not empowered, make women the energy entrepreneurs. Problem number three, there's no awareness on health and education. Okay, let's make a village nurse who will go around town, who will partner with a uh, health company, get pharmaceutical companies involved, create partnerships, you know, and, and put everything together, put all the ingredients together in a box. And that's how we just started rolling out our projects. And then when the actual projects, when you launch something with passion, you do fail at times, but usually there's success. And when these projects started turning out into international best practices, and the UN Foundation, the UN Habitat, UNICEF, they all came on board to endorse my projects as international best practices, wow. that's when the table turned. That's when everybody started saying, oh, okay, you know, she was thinking something all along. <laughs> she, she wasn't she knew. that stupid that we were thinking. So that gave confidence to my teams, that gave confidence to the industry. Today we have, we at that time went on to doing some 800 villages, converted them to solar. Mm -hmm. um, we were the first company and today we have around 35 to 40 companies in the solar, solar energy space, yeah. working across all these domains. Because what we opened up then was a sector, was a virgin market nobody was talking about. So uh, that's what, and then, then you know, when later I, I got accredited by different institutions, the projects got accredited. And uh, so it was never, for me, it was never a decision. It was always an evolution based on my passion. Passion, okay. Yeah. So how did uh, these women in Pakistan um, answer to you proposal to be leaders in, in such a new yeah. sector, yeah. Uh, energy, I mean, it's kind of weird, or it probably was weird for them, not for these women. Oh, oh yes, of course it was. And, and again, the areas that we were working in, uh, they were rural areas, villages, right? Anybody familiar with the region, um, my friend Gitanjali here obviously is, so anybody familiar with the region knows how conservative our rural life is. Uh, the women were obviously very hesitant in the beginning, but again, just like myself, we had to break that first glass ceiling. When you break that first glass ceiling, when you make that first success story, it becomes an inspiration for everybody to follow. So I had to find my leaders. When I went into a bit, and I used to go myself, the uh -huh. first 50, 100 villages, I went myself because I had to prove my point. Uh -huh. So I went myself, <laughs> And I used to meet the shortlisted candidates to become my energy entrepreneurs. We call them Roshna Bibi. Roshna means light in Urdu, in Pakistani language. So we call them Roshna Bibi. So they were light ladies. So okay. they became light ladies. And when I would visit these villages, everybody would call them like Roshna, Roshna come here, Roshna do this. So they became synonymous with light, uh -huh. with hope, 
with energy access. Energy is, ho energy is hope, energy is light, energy is life. Uh -huh. So I used to go to these villages myself and pick up my leaders you know, my champions, uh -huh. in, in and those talking to those women yeah. and identifying who's the one who can stand up against How odds. How did you choose those women? So we had a technical evaluation process. Yeah. We had a proper evaluation process, but then I used to interview them myself mm -hmm. to see who has the burning desire to do, do something, something in life. So that tomorrow when I go back home, I'm not going to live in that village, when I'm going to go back home, somebody comes up to her, she can stand up and make a mark. Right. You know, because I needed those first 50 game changers, those first 50 Roshna BBs, and then the remaining would just follow. And then when BBC and when all these TV channels started coming to these villages and interviewing my Roshna BBs, they became celebrities, you know, wow. in their villages. Right. They became the woman of respect, they became the celebrities. And then I started getting calls from other villages that, you know, we want to do the project, make me the Roshna BB. <laughs> right, so it was like a yeah. ball, so you have a to, snowball. Yes, you have to push the first few success stories and then the universe starts pulling it towards you, you know? Yeah, so the, the project with the microfinancing, yes. credits and yes. that was in that process? That, that, was, that was separate. So this was energy access through mm -hmm. energy entrepreneurs. And then we had a se separate pro uh, project for women economic livelihood development. And that we used to do by giving them access to finance, mm -hmm. access to trainings, and setting up the whole business with them in collaboration with private sector companies. Okay. So I would, for example, work with Nestle Pakistan and create Nestle ruler sales agents. Mm -hmm. Now these ruler sales agents will be my women who I've trained. And in partnership with Nestle, I've given them sustainable economic livelihood. Okay. So we had very interesting projects going yeah, on throughout so the process. So it was like little by little. Little by little. Every, every day uh -huh. during flights, you would think, okay, what are the other problems that we're not addressing? You know? Um, and it was always just list down problems. And I used to say that, you know, bring problems to me. I used to tell my <laughs> team, bring problems. I, I, I thrive on problems. You know, I'm hungry for problems. Uh -huh. Because you bring me problems. And then I'm going to just start thinking about basic, naive solutions. I'm not going to create an Einstein formula, some theory of hypotheses. No, just simple math, some simple logic. Uh -huh. And then I'm just going to connect the right stakeholders to make it happen. Because you cannot do anything in isolation. Right. You cannot do anything by yourself. You're not supposed to do things by yourself. We all have different roles. So then I will see, OK, where do I get the government? Where do I get the private sector? Where do I engage the civil society? Where do I engage the woman-led organizations for creating advocacy, for creating awareness? And then I would go to each one of them and tell them what is in it for you. So what are the, bring challenge, them on board. the challenge in that collaboration? Because you mentioning government, companies, yeah. they all have very different mindsets. Yeah, yeah. So how, how did you bring them together to collaborate? So initially, in my years as the CEO of the two companies, I, I simply realized that I cannot do this alone. The path that I've chosen, the challenges that I've chosen, I cannot do them alone. I cannot achieve these solutions alone. So I have to partner with all these stakeholders. Initially, it was very challenging because, as you rightly said, every stakeholder has a different language. They have a different expectation. They have a different pace of work. The government and the private sector are two very different entities very different worlds, but I would go to each one of them, try to understand their situation, their expectation, and give them a piece of the pie with what is in it for them. Mm -hmm. What does the government want? They want their gov federal goals to be achieved. They want their ministerial goals to be achieved. What does the private sector want? Marketing, branding, visibility, profitability. What does the civil society want? impact, beneficiaries, community problems, livelihoods. Mm -hmm. So I would go and talk to them in their language, in their understanding, and give them a what is in it for me. Mm -hmm. So that everybody comes in with a piece of the pie and it becomes a mutually profitable value-added proposition. Win-win. Win-win. Win-win always. It's also written in my key expertise now, win-win, <laughs> because I create win-win partnerships. And that same thing is what I'm doing now. With, at a much larger level, mm -hmm. with governments, with private sector, with development agencies, <coughs> bringing multi-dimensional stakeholders together on one table mm -hmm. for one development challenge 
creating win-win partnerships. Okay. So that's, that's the work that you're doing with the uh, task force in Pakistan? No, no so... That, um, that's another... That's another one, one. yeah. That's another... <laughs> yeah, that's, an, that's another part that's, of my... Okay, so tell us about this, because this is, this is a very interesting work also in, uh, in a governmental level. Oh, yes. 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 So wh what are you doing there? Because there are like 16... Uh, people that are working to departments. The departments, government okay. departments, yes. Um, so I'll just take you a little back again to understand the context. So I, I, I set up those two companies and I led them for about 12 years. And then I got in, um, invited randomly by the UN Secretary General to become a member of his high level panel for women economic empowerment. This high level panel was a global task force, which was Ban Ki-moon at that time. Uh, which had myself, uh, Christine Lagarde, Managing Director IMF, uh, President of World Bank, Executive Director of UN Women, uh, Managing Director of ILO, World Economic Forum, all global leadership, and myself, for some reason, which I still don't know. Uh, you and still don't know? I still don't know. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Even till the first meeting, I thought they've made a mistake, and when I'm going to go there, they're going to say, oh, sorry, it was not you. <laughs> but uh, it happened to be me, so I, I, I lucked out. But I call that my professional climax. Because in my professional journey, I was said to be this entrepreneur who was creating solutions to problems, impacting people on the ground, creating projects, you know, and, and working in the field, like with my passion, with my, you know, with my strength. But this, when I, when I sat, and I still remember, March 2016, I was sitting in the office of Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General uh, of the United Nations, with all of these global leaders, the President of Costa Rica, International Secretary of State UK, wow. Minister of Tolerance UAE, Sheikh Alubna, so all these people and myself, and we were deciding what we are going to do for the next two years to come up with a global policy of empowering women around the world. And when I came out of that two-hour two meeting, and even there I told them that with all of you guys on the table, World Bank, IMF, ILO, World Economic Forum, United Nations, what can I do for creating a policy, right? So I told them what I'll do is give you an example of what a young woman can do when she's given a platform to empower herself for the woman of her country, for the woman of the world. Mm -hmm. And that became, I just said it, you know, I just said it, and then on my flight, and that became a call for action by Pakistan in the United Nations language. And then on my flight back home, I was thinking, okay then, what am I going to do? How am I going to create a case study for the United Nations being a woman for the woman of my country? And then when I came back, um, the chief minister of Punjab at that time, uh, Punjab again, guys who don't know Pakistan much, it's our largest province with 50% of the population, 110 million people. So that's the context. He picked me up as his advisor to become on, on women empowerment as well. And with that, I realized that I just need to explode now in the world out there. And I need to forget, I need to move beyond my focus on my two organizations and go out and impact the entire women and, and, and youth and all the agendas I work on in Pakistan, in the region and globally. So that's how I then evolved as an independent advisor, which I am now, right. wearing multiple hats, advising different governments, different private sector, UN agencies on gender, climate change and partnerships. Because those lessons I learned back then as an entrepreneur, that we need to create synergies, mm -hmm. we need to create partnerships, it still holds. We need to come together to mm -hmm. achieve any development goal. Okay, so it, it looks like maybe there are some questions. Sure. Uh, oh, no, ah, I thought uh, you took the... No, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 okay, okay, but there is, there is one. <laughs> okay, I thought uh, there were some oh. people. This. Uh, hello, uh, Pisa, thank you so much for the talk with us. Um, I never speak in English. I don't know if you can understand me. It's fine, um, you translate. Yeah. Yes. But my question is simple. Um, I love your country. Oh, I, thank you. I love the Hunza Valley. I love the Rakaposi. And my first trip to Pakistan was last, last year, but the government... Wow. 
of Spain don't recommend travel to Pakistan. And my question is, what's the solution to travel more people to Pakistan, to yeah. know the wonderful people in Pakistan, the, the wonderful places in Pakistan? Yes. And what's the solution to open the mind to the European people to understand that uh, when you travel an, an another country like Pakistan, yeah. you open your mind yeah. and you put a new seat in the woman uh, from Pakistan, the idea that you can sell it and you can choose another kind of life because you can speak with people that another country is. And this is my question, and this is the problem that I put for thank you. Thank you, thank you. No, no, that's <laughs> because a, I think this is some, something you. important. Thank you. No, that's a, a very important question and a very important problem. Um, you're right, Pakistan is wonderful. And many people who from Europe or the US or any, anywhere um, outside who end up coming to the country fall in love with it. You can see so many documentaries on Pakistan. You can see so many documentaries about people from Europe who came to Pakistan, did a bike ride till the north and back. Um, and they absolutely fell in love with it because we're, we're, we're just like we're Spanish people. I tweeted this morning that it feels like I'm in Lahore. The love, the warmth, the loudness, the party, you know, we're, we're exactly like that. We're, we're, we're the same. Um, so it's, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. You're right, there are two problems, um, both external and internal. One is I feel Pakistan has not done a good job with the marketing and branding of the country, like a product. And in my position now, um, as the advisor to the Prime Minister, I'm actually working on this task. We have a, a Ministry of Tourism set up, and we're actually very actively working because the new Prime Minister is very focused on bringing people to Pakistan, tourism to Pakistan. Um, he's always traveled the world himself. So we are very focused now on working on the marketing and branding of the country, making people see the good part of Pakistan because unfortunately, the media likes to follow and showcase only what is going wrong. Even if it's in going wrong in a little roundabout. I'll tell you a story. Um, I had some friends visiting from Europe once and we were going around town, we went to dinner, had some nice wine, we were going to another social event, there was a wedding happening, and our weddings are glamorous, and again, Gitanjali, you would know, our weddings are like Bollywood movies, okay? Uh, fantastic. And, uh, and, and when we were going, happily, on a little roundabout in the city, there were some 50 people standing with some boards protesting for something, right? Um, and, and entire media of Lahore was surrounding that roundabout and covering that protest. And they were telling me that, you know, if we were back home, this is what we will see. And we will say, oh, Lahore is in chaos again. You know, no, Lahore is not in chaos. Just because 50 people out of 26 million who live in that city decided to spend their night protesting for something doesn't mean the remaining 25 million, God knows what, are not having fun, you know? So it's a matter of perception. Your question on how you can travel, um, I have uh, uh, visited the Basque countryside three yeah, years ago yeah, where we yeah. met and it was to promote Pakistan because the Baltistan Foundation works in Gilgit Baltistan, the, the area you mentioned, and they're headquartered in Basque, Bilbao, so San Sebastian. And I came to meet your ministers and I came to meet uh, other stakeholders to extend relationships between the two countries. And we have set up some guided tours from Basque to go to Pakistan and they go every year, twice a year and they love it. I can introduce you to those people mm -hmm. and you can come with them because they'll arrange all the logistics. <laughs> and so you see you in Pakistan. <laughs> and you invite all of them. All of you, yes, come from Basque to Pakistan, okay? I want to see all of you. In <laughs> Hola. Oh. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Fisa, for your presentation. So my question is, well, I believe in the sustainable development goals, and I'm very committed to achieving them. And you've been working on them for a long time. So 
Can you please talk about your impression of the um, Millennium Development Goals and the evolution, the Sustainable Development Goals, and why you think they can be achieved now, they, um, they can be successful, they can be achieved, and they can have a further impact than the Millennium Development Goals? What's the difference between them? Um, that's a very important and logical question. Uh, definitely, we, we were, we're working, many of us in this room are working very actively on the SDGs. Um, I truly feel that there's a lot of good work that's happening which in, on various sustainable development goals, especially the ones that I'm looking at, women empowerment and climate change, partnerships, sustainability, economic livelihood, all comes in the middle. But I would say that there's a lot more that needs to be done on every single agenda because the problems this world faces are too, too huge. The magnitude of those problems are too huge. For me, the solution, and this is what I keep telling to everybody that I work with, I'm advising UNICEF right now, UNESCO, UNDP, uh, UN Women Regional Office. My, and, and, and people are agreeing to the solution more or so because now I'm working with them on achieving it, is to create partnerships. We don't have, we are in 2019 now, 2020 is around the corner. 10 years will fly by, we won't even know, right? And then we'll be sitting in 2030 doing a stock take and seeing, oh shit, you know, the SDGs didn't even work. So then we'll have to come with some CDGs or whatever. Now the problem is, there is a lot of good work already happening in this world. There are lots of good case studies, there are lots of good examples, lots of good innovations, lots of good minds, lots of good human resource already there. What we need to do is stop reinventing the wheel. Stop making the same mistakes again and again. Learn from our mistakes for once and move on with life. I was, we were talking about this last night at dinner as well. So if somebody learned from something in five years, we can learn from it in five minutes now. And technology brings that together. Technology connects us. I'm sitting here from Pakistan, listening, talking to all of you and vice versa. This is the ambit of technology, right? So we need to use, we need to quit brick and mortar models. We need to use technology, embrace technology, create partnerships with the nexus of technology and bring different stakeholders together so that we scale up each other's work, we accelerate the pace, and only then, I think, we will be able to achieve the SDGs in due course. Because one-on-one, -on -one, working in silos, working in isolation, I really don't think it's possible. But if we work together, like Captain Planet, put all the forces together, only then we can achieve and accelerate that pace. Okay. So that's my take, partnerships and technology. <laughs> okay, no, I was one more question. Ask her for the last trip, uh, she was coming from Sweden yes. and she was talking about education, education of, because I think technology, partnership, how to work in partnership, all that it has to be taught at yes. schools, yes. Uh, yes. so what's your reflection on that? Oh, I mean, I'm... that's that's the future, I guess, uh, making another kind of education for the girls and totally. for the boys. Totally. Um, I'm, 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 I'm just coming from Stockholm right now, um, um, as Begonia just mentioned, and I was there on the Wing Summit talking about the subject education in girls, investing in education in girls. Is it a humanitarian case or is it a business case? And at the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on women economic empowerment, we established all the key ingredients that are required for the economic empowerment of women. And we realized that it's a Maslow's hierarchy, and economic empowerment comes at the top. If a woman is economically empowered, if, if she's financially self-sustainable, then she's legally empowered, she can get social empowerment, she can get political empowerment. Mm -hmm. The first thing is, the first priority, the first glass ceiling to break is economic empowerment. And, and with that, we realized that it goes back into education for girls. When you deprive girls of basic education at school level, you're just cutting their legs to achieve any kind of empowerment in the future. You are snipping the roots of a tree before it has the capacity to bear fruit. Right? So if you cut off the roots, how will the tree ever grow and bear fruit? So that's the humanitarian case. But with my work in the woman empowerment field, we have realized that it's not just a humanitarian case. It's a business decision. 
There's a huge report by McKinsey. It's called the Gender Pay Parity. It is, on it is covered on 500 fortune companies. I would highly recommend everyone in this room to go through it and I can provide you with the links. The working of the UN high level panel was based on that. And that those findings of the report clearly state that because of this gender gap in the world, we're losing out on $26 trillion of global GDP by 2030. The world is going to be short of $26 trillion of global GDP just because we are not putting all women in the workforce. $26 trillion is the combined GDP of United States and China combined today. Imagine the scale, right? And it, the report also further did surveys and found out that women, that companies with more women on management positions and boards had 28 to 32% higher returns than companies that were not gender, gender balanced or that did not have women. It's a simple logical rationale. You're, you're serving the clients which are men and women. On the other side of the table too, you need to have men and women. Right brain, left brain, biology works like that. We add, we coexist. You know, when we coexist in nature, when we coexist in creation of children, how can we not coexist in economy? And this, is, uh, this, is, this has all been proved with facts, with logic, with survey of 500 fortune companies. And it all goes back to access to education. You need to give access to education to girls so they can get the equal opportunity to enter the workforce like boys and grow, not just to contribute to themselves and their families, but to contribute to the GDP of the world. Well, Lisa, it's a pity, but we have to finish. And I have to thank you for being, for bringing us some magic, eh? because I believe that you have some sayings, <laughs> that you believe in magic. I believe in magic. I believe in magic every day, um, yes. Thank you very much uh, for your star burn uh, hard eh, to fight and to carry on fighting. Yeah, yeah, I know. And hopefully many people will, will be inspired and will be doing many things like you. Yeah. We need many visas in the world. <laughs> Absolutely. I would love to see many visas in the world. But yeah, let's, let's keep the burning desire on. Let's keep believing in ourselves. And uh, let's create our professions into our passions because that's when success is there for all of us. So yeah, thank you very much for having thank me here. You. Thank you.